Graham Joseph here. Wanted to talk to you a little bit today about my Hebrew Roots, the Hebrew Roots movement, dispel a few of the myths and rumors, and explain why I believe it's the original Christianity that Christ and the Apostles observed. Now, one false comment that I've heard quite a number of times is that Hebrew Roots is some new fly-by-night religious gimmick to try and lure Christians into Judaism. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. Myself, I've been Torah observant and following the example of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, for my entire life. I'm the fourth generation in my family to do so, and my children are the fifth. And in 44 years of observing the Sabbath, I haven't one time kept it in a Jewish synagogue. Why? Because I'm a Christian. I believe the Son of God came to this earth to redeem us from our sins. However, I don't believe he came to start a brand new Greco-Romanized religion and set out to destroy the old one. He only came to set it back on track. But if you look today at the majority of Christians, they have a religious practice that's completely different from the practices outlined in the Old Testament, also known as the Tanakh, completely different from the religious practices observed by Jesus Christ and the apostles, and completely different from the religious practices observed by the first century church. And numerous historians will attest to this. Notice what Dr. William Davies wrote in his book, Paul and Jewish Christianity. Everywhere, especially east of the Roman Empire, there would be Jewish Christians whose outward way of life would not be markedly different from that of the Jews. They took for granted that the gospel was continuous with the religion of Moses. For them, the new covenant, which Jesus had set up at the time of the Last Supper with his disciples, did not mean that the covenant he made between God and Israel was no longer in force. They still observed the feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. They also continued to be circumcised to keep the weekly Sabbath concerning the Mosaic regulations concerning food. According to some scholars, they must have been so strong that right up to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, they were the dominant element in the Christian movement. So the idea that having this belief in Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus, as your Christ, as your Messiah, and still at the same time keeping the law isn't some new, crazy, outlandish, radical cult group. It's just not the case. The original first century church didn't think so. They had no problems harmonizing these two concepts. And right up until the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Jewish Christianity was the dominant element in the Christian movement. Notice what renowned historian Edward Gibbons says in his masterpiece classical work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, in chapter 15 on the first century church. The first 15 bishops of Jerusalem were all circumcised Jews, and the congregation over which they presided united the law of Moses with the doctrines of Christ. It was natural that the primitive tradition of the church, which was founded only 40 days after the death of Christ and was governed almost as many years under the immediate inspection of his apostle, should be received as a standard of orthodoxy. The distant churches very frequently appealed to the authority of their venerable parent. And so not only does Edward Gibbons here admit the original church united the law of Moses with the doctrines of Christ, but also that the Jerusalem church was the headquarters church that set the standard for all the other outlining churches. And in a sense, that is the definition of Hebrew roots. Christians who unite the law of Moses with the doctrines of Christ, and that these aren't conflicting ideas. And that's how Christianity began. So when did it change? Notice another historian, uh, Jesse Lyman Hurlbut, author, theologian, Methodist minister, he writes in the story of the Christian church. Fifty years after St. Paul's life, a curtain hangs over the church through which we strive vainly to look. And when at last it rises at about 120 AD with the writings of the earliest church fathers, we find a church in many aspects very different from that in the days of St. Peter and St. Paul. And so this transformation takes place. We start out with a Christianity that unites the law of Moses with the doctrines of Christ, governed under the direct inspection of the apostles and the writers of the New Testament. And then after their death, we see a Christianity arising in the second century very different. 
And by the time we get to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, we see a completely Romanized church. Check out this quote from Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, on page 232. Now, granted, this is a work of fiction, but it does a great job of illustrating what Emperor Constantine actually did to Christianity. Historians still marvel at the brilliance in which Constantine converted sun-worshipping pagans to Christianity by fusing pagan symbols, dates, and rituals into the growing Christian tradition, he created a kind of a hybrid religion that was acceptable to both parties. Original Langland said, Jewish Christians honored the Jewish Sabbaths of Saturday, but Constantine shifted it to coincide with the pagans' venerable day of the sun. He paused, grinning, to this day, most churchgoers attend services on Sunday with no idea that they are there on the account of the pagan sun god's weekly tribute Sunday. Now, once again, Da Vinci Code is a work of fiction, but it is really good about illustrating this point. And as we continue to read other historians, Pulitzer Prize winning historians like Will and Ariel Durant, we see that's exactly what happened. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, by the Durants, page 595. Christianity did not destroy paganism, it adopted it. The Greek mind dying came into a transmigrated life in the theology and liturgy of the church. The Greek language, having reigned for centuries over philosophy, became the vehicle of Christian literature and ritual. The Greek mysteries passed down through the impressive mystery of the Mass. Other pagan cultures contributed to this syncretist result. From Egypt came the ideas of divine trinity, a personal immortality of reward and punishment. From Egypt, the adoration of the mother and child. The Mithraic ritual so closely remembered the, resembled the Eucharistic sacrifice of the Mass, the Christian fathers charged the devil with inventing these similarities to mislead frail minds. Christianity was the great creation of the ancient pagan world. The Eucharist, a concept long sanctified by time, the pagan mind needed no schooling to receive it. By embodying the mystery of the Mass, Christianity became the last and greatest of the mystery religions. And so by mixing Greek philosophy, Roman mythology, and Christian terminology, this hybrid religion was formed under Constantine. And this was all done in such a rapid pace that caused a lot of confusion. Paul Johnson in his book, History of Christianity, says this, Many Christians did not make a clear distinction between this sun cult and their own. They referred to Christ driving his chariot across the sky. So why would the Roman Christians be, be referring to Christ as riding his chariot across the sky? Well, according to Roman and Greek mythology, Apollos, or Sol Victicus, also known as the sun's god, stole his father's chariot and rode it across the sky. And there were so many similarities between the Romanized practices of Christ and the Roman paganism, people got a lot of these two ideas confused. And a lot of the early Christian art, there is a striking similarity between mosaics of Christ and that of Apollos. And this caused a lot of confusion. Paul Johnson continues, they held their nativity feasts on Sunday, and once again, we're talking about pagans. We're not talking about Christians, in case you're getting confused as well. They held their services on Sunday, knelt towards the east, and had their nativity feast on December 25th, the birthday of the sun at the winter solstice. During the Lagan Pagan pagan revival under Emperor Julian, many Christians found it easy to apostatize because of this confusion. The Bishop of Troy told Julian he'd always prayed secretly to the sun. Constantine never abandoned sun worship and kept the sun on his coins. He made Sunday into a day of rest. Now, you don't by chance know of any Roman churches universal churches that by chance hold their services on Sunday, kneel to the east on Ishtar Sunday, keep a nativity festival on December 25th by chance, do you? Ring any bells? Well, this was all created under Constantine and later Roman emperors. 
And when Constantine on 321 made Sunday into official day of rest for the empire, he didn't do it in the name of Christ. He did it in the name of the sun god. Here's his very famous quote. It says, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and all the people residing in the cities rest, and let all the workshops be closed. Once again, on the venerable day of the sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N, S-U-N. This law was put in place to honor and venerate the sun god, and had nothing to do with Christianity. Now, one argument that's been used many times to try and explain away this syncretism, this paganizing of Christianity, is to state that, well, God had planned all along to replace the Jewish religion. He just did it gradually and used the Roman Empire to do so. Well, this explanation is coming from the belief of progressive revelation, that God did not reveal all the knowledge about his way of life all of a sudden to man or even Israel, but slowly revealed it over a period of time through multiple dispensations, through multiple church fathers over thousands and thousands of years. Well, I completely disagree with this notion. Although there are instances where God has hidden the fulfillment of prophecy from those who aren't going to be alive when it actually happens, and he does, in a sense, you know, progressively reveal information to the reader of the Bible, meaning you have to read the whole book all the way through to get all the information. The idea that the way of life that God requires from each of us either changes or wasn't fully revealed into the time of, until the time of Constantine is utterly ridiculous. And a matter of fact, this paganizing of Christianity by Rome was fully prophesied by the New Testament writers centuries in advance. And they gave multiple warnings not to accept it when it happened. Notice the prophetic warning Paul gave in Ephesians, uh, to the Ephesians in Acts chapter 20. He says this, Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. I know after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from amongst your own selves, men shall arise speaking perverse things to draw disciples away after themselves. Watch therefore, and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to admonish every one of you night and day with tears. Now, does this sound like Paul is going to be okay with this new Roman Christianity when it appears? Also, notice how Paul is speaking the affirmative. These aren't things that might happen or could happen. No, he says these things will happen. After I die, grievous wolves shall enter in amongst you, and they shall arise speaking perverse things, and will draw disciples away after themselves. Paul isn't talking about some hypothetical situation here or using a bunch of symbolism or imagery, or that these things might be possible, or be careful, these things could happen. But instead, he's talking about very specific things, a specific prophecy about the future of the church that was to take place shortly after his departure. Notice that Jude gives almost the exact same warning. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice that Jude says almost the exact same thing that Paul did. Certain men have crept in. Not maybe, not be careful, it could happen. No, this has happened and will happen. And what are these men doing? Uh, they're turning grace into lewdness, or as the Amplified Version says, turning grace into lawlessness and immorality. You don't by chance know of any ministers today that use grace as an excuse to break God's law and use it to commit immorality by chance? Ah, of course not. That's crazy talk. Nobody does that, right? Except all of Protestantism, right? Uh, so what is Jude's solution to these men who will creep in unnoticed? 
these spiritual creepers? Well, he says, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. Fight for the faith which was once and for all delivered to them. The faith that you have already received. Do you at any time get the notion that Jude is telling a church, you know, there's going to be this new Romanized church that's going to be starting up in a few years, and they're going to be changing pretty much all the doctrines, and the church is going to be shifting from being a Hebrew church based on God's law and the Torah into becoming a pagan syncretist church. And when that happens, you know, just go with it. It's all good. I got you covered, right? Uh, of course not. He's saying the exact opposite. Earnestly contend for the faith that you have already received, the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. Nowhere do we get the notion from any of the New Testament writers that God is going to progressively reveal new truths through multiple upcoming dispensations. Notice the exact same warning in 2 Peter where Peter tells them to beware of this coming apostasy. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. But false prophets also arose amongst people, just as there will be false teachers amongst you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So here we have Paul, Jude, and now Peter giving the exact same warning that there is this imminent apostasy in the church. And the timing is, of, is also very interesting. All three of these are saying that this is happening now, if not going to happen shortly after our departure. There's this infiltration of these spiritual creepers that's already started. And shortly afterwards, um, they're going to take over the church, basically. And these heresies aren't going to come up in a thousand years down the road or, or who knows when. No, but immediately after the death of the apostles. And historically, we see that's exactly what happened. Notice another warning given by Paul in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures to which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Once again, Paul is warning Timothy and the church to beware of these impostors who will grow worse and worse. And what's his solution? Have an open mind, explore new religious ideas, have a little tolerance for Roman and Greek philosophy and traditions. <laughs> no, of course not. The exact opposite. Continue in what you have learned, remembering who taught those things to you, and remember the Holy Scriptures that Timothy knew from childhood. Now, what holy scriptures did Timothy know from childhood? Did he grow up reciting John 3.16? No, the New Testament hadn't even been written yet, and Timothy was a Jew. Paul is telling Timothy to protect yourself from this influx of heresy. Continue in what you have already learned, remembering from who taught them to you, and remember the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. Does this sound like Paul is telling Timothy to accept the new Roman Christianity, or is he telling him to remain rooted in the Hebrew Christianity that he grew up in? You tell me. And there are multiple other warnings that have been given to the church of this impending apostasy. We have scriptures in Galatians, 2 Timothy, 2 Corinthians. Christ also gives a warning over in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. And so when Paul, Peter, Jude, and even Yeshua gave multiple warnings of an impending apostasy, and from every historians, and we see this major religious shift that did take place as prophesied, who had the authority to say it was okay to follow along with the crowd when it happened? For instance, who had the authority to say that Christmas was now a sacred day to worship God? 
any encyclopedia will tell you that Christmas was a pagan Roman holiday practiced long before Christ, and that Messiah was most likely born in the autumn rather than in the dead of winter. Who had the right to say Saturnalia was now a holy day? Who had the right to say Easter was now a sacred day to worship God? Encyclopedia Britannica will tell you that, in fact, Easter was adopted from a Roman uh, holiday of fertility worship. I mean, why else would you have rabbits and eggs to be symbols on this day? Who had the right to redefine what was holy? Who had the right to exchange the seventh day of the week as sacred and set apart and as a day of rest to now the first day of week being sacred? All the first century church, including the 12 apostles and Christ himself only observed the seventh day Sabbath. Who had the right to redefine these truths? Who had the authority uh, to say all of the Torah, all the Old Testament law is done away with? Well, Christ himself said, whoever breaks the least of these points of law, whoever breaks the least of the Torah and teaches men to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away until heaven and earth pass away. Who had the authority to override the authority of the Son of God? Who had the authority to change all of these truths? Who had the right to turn Christianity from being a Hebrew religion into a Greco-Roman religion? Is your view of Christianity Hebrew or Roman? Why is over 90% of the Bible written by Hebrews, and yet most of the Christian customs are all Roman? Why did Yeshua the Messiah observe only Hebrew feasts, yet most Christians observe Roman holidays? Why were all of Messiah's disciples Hebrews, and yet there has never been a single Hebrew Pope? Why did the Christian gospel go first to the Hebrews and then to the rest of the world, yet the Roman Catholic Church carried out numerous inquisitions to try and eradicate Christian Hebrews? Numerous historians, including Jesse Lyman Hurlbut, Edward Gibbons, Paul Johnson, William Davies, Will and Ariel Durant admit there was a major change between the belief practices of the early first century Hebrew church and the later Romanized universal church that followed. And the apostles and writers of the New Testament predicted it. The Hebrew Roots Church is not some new fly-by-night religious gimmick designed to trick people into Judaism. To the contrary, we are the ones who kept the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints, despite persecution from the Jews and the Romans. We are the ones that hid in the wilderness for thousands of years. We are the church that suffered through multiple Catholic inquisitions as Judaizers. We are the ones who kept the Sabbath day. We have kept the holy days as did the first century church. And I will continue to do so as well as my family has done for generations. And we don't have to apologize for our beliefs. I can find every single one of my religious practices and beliefs explained in the Bible. How about you? I strongly encourage you to take a close look at your belief in God and ask yourself a few questions. Did the creator of the universe put me on this planet for a reason? Does he have a specific code of conduct that he requires of me? And does any man have the authority to change that? If you answer yes, yes, and heck no, then maybe you should consider Hebrew roots.